Well, good morning to all of you. I often say, good morning, beloved. I want you to say to your television screen and your cell phone or your, or your computer, I want you to shout out, good morning, beloved. And I can hear your heart this morning. And we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord woke me up this morning about 4 a.m. and drove me to the book of Lamentations. I had not read it for quite some time. And I spent the morning praying through that amazing book. 2,600 years ago, the people of God were, were sent into exile for some 70 years. Can you imagine? Not a year with COVID-19, 70 years. And I, and I love verse 7 of Lamentations 3 that says, He has walled me in so I cannot go out. Oh, that's a COVID-19 statement, is it not? And yet God was not only getting the unbelieving world's attention, he was getting his people's attention, and he raised up the prophet Jeremiah to say words that we need today. Listen to Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 and following. As, as Jeremiah prays, as we pray, remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and be silent. And then in verse 39 and following, why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. We lift up our heart and our hands toward God in heaven. Let's pray together. Our God, we lift up our hearts toward you. During this time when we are not able to gather indoors, certainly we have the privilege now of gathering outdoors, and we're so grateful for that. But it's not the same, Lord, and we know that. To some degree, you've walled us in so we cannot go out, but you've done so to get our attention, and we cry out to you. And we examine and probe our ways and we return to you. We lift up our hearts and our hands toward you, our God in heaven. In Jesus' name. And God's people agreed and said, amen. In the season where my hope in life is to just survive. And the teardrops fall You revive me with your warm embrace Your healing grace So beautiful Let me see if you say You're the sunshine in the rain You're the purpose in the pain Love burns the clouds away When I'm close to you You're the light when life is wrong Hold me up when hope is gone Love turns the night to day about the promises of God when we're close to Him. You see, I never thought I could be good enough. I never thought I could be good enough to deserve your touch. A soul like mine. You gave me something I was looking for. Never found before. Such a love divine. You're the sunshine in the in the pain, love burns the clouds away when I'm close to you. You're the light when life is wrong. Hold me up when hope is gone. Love turns the night to day when I'm close to you. the 
purpose in the pain Love burns the clouds away When I'm close to you You're the light when life is wrong Hold me up when hope is gone Love turns the night to day When I'm close to you
on, say early. Everything that's happening in our world, as Pastor read in Lamentations, our hope will be when our eyes are seeking the face of God. When we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, our, our future can be sure. Dan, if you could lead us now. We're going to be going through humility, repentance, and faith. Thank you, brother. Please pray with me as we pray into humility. Our gracious God, we are so thankful for your mercy to us. and. We thank you for that, that glorious sacrifice of your son that brings us to relationship 
with God our Father, that we can call you our Father. And Lord, we pray, we, we lift up to you our, our, our land, our, our body, our church. Um, we just ask that we would be responding to the call that you say that if you humble yourself, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sins and restore their land. Lord, we just bow our hearts before you in, in a time that's so confused and in, in, with the world and all its, its lusts and boastful pride. Lord, we do humble our hearts and, and come before you as, as, as our shepherd. And we ask that, we would, that you would draw us to yourself, that we would be bowing low before you, that be, we'd be seeking you earnestly in prayer and knowing that's where the power of God is, 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 is relatable to us. That's where we actually see you work, Lord, is when we're on our knees before you. And so we ask that your, your people would be drawing to you, that we'd be turning from our ways, and uh, that, that we would be a light set on a hill. And Lord, not through the ways of the world, but through your spirit, this is done. So we, we just pray that you would continue to teach us more in prayer and through your word to seek you humbly on our knees and to seek you together. Now, church family, will you pray with me over the coming low of repentance, Lord? Thank you, Father, that in light of this humility, that you do tell us to turn away. May we recognize through the contrition, that like being crushed through the weight and the guilt of sin, that it doesn't just bring us to a position of feeling low for self-humility, but a humble position to turn towards you, Father. May we be resolute in the fact that we have an actionable item, something that we can do, Father, that you empower us through your Holy Spirit, Father. Thank you for that great help that you gave us, Lord, to turn away and to run into your arms, Father. Not that we can do it of ourselves, Lord, but that you strengthen us and that we know when we are low and we are weak, you can be strong and you can lead us and guide us in the ways that you would want us to live fruitfully for you, Father, glorifying you in your name, God, recognizing that we can do great things in the power of your name. We thank you and love you. Church family, if you would, just join me as we come before the Lord. I invite you to pray with me. Pray with me that the Lord would strengthen and encourage our faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I am reminded of Hebrews 11.1, 1, Lord. We understand what our faith is. We understand, Lord, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Father, the conviction of things unseen. Lord, there is so much we hope for right now. And there is so much we don't know. There is so much that is truly unseen, Father. But nothing is outside of your view. And there is nothing you don't know and you don't have providence over, Father. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of that daily, each and every day, Father, as the, we approach the, the things that lie before us, Lord, that we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened, Lord, because you are the king of our lives, Lord, and you are in control. I pray that that faith, Father, a faith that is not circumstantial, a faith that is not governed by our immediate situations, Lord God, but a faith that is eternal, a faith that rests in you alone, Lord, that that faith would guide us, preserve us, strengthen us, and equip us to do your ministry on this earth during this time. It's in your holy and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. My name is Michael. I'm the student ministry pastor at our Maple campus, and I love what we just did, that moment of prayer. We just had a prayer and worship night with the students uh, at our Maple campus on Wednesday nights, and one of the things I reminded them of is that when we pray, there's no lag, there's no latency, there's no delay. God hears us instantly. It's such an amazing thing that, that our faith is one built on a hope and a hope that does not disappoint. 
So it's my privilege this morning to welcome you. If you're a first time uh, viewer this morning, if you're a regular, welcome. And we just want to say hello. This morning you're of course watching online and we have something called an online connection card. As the name implies, this is a great way for us to connect to you, for you to connect to us. If you have a question, if there's a way we can encourage you, or maybe you just need to give us your contact information or update it, you can do all those things right there. You can find that on the church website or the church app. We also want to sincerely thank you for your financial giving, especially during the season. Everything that's taking place right now, I mean, the, the internet stream to, to broadcast this service, the, the electricity for the lights to be on, the staff being here, is because of your giving. So to continue to support the ministry of, of Campus Bible Church, you can use the Give Now portion, again, on the website or app, and once again, we thank you for that. We also want to draw your attention, to, of course, to the prayer requests. Keep sending those prayer requests in. We are, are honored that you're allowing us to pray with you on those things, and we do pray for them. So whatever way we might be able to pray for you, let us know. And not only that, but also let us know the ways that uh, God has answered prayers, any praise reports that you have, any ways that God has been working in your life. We would love to hear that as well. Now, of course, we have our, our 8.30 and our 10.30 services that we're streaming online, but I also want to remind you that we have outdoor live services at 10.30 at both our Maple and Palm campus as well. So you'll get the worship, you'll get the sermon, but you'll get it outside live in God's beautiful creation. So we invite you to check that out at either our, our Maple or Palm campus at 10.30. And also want to invite you out for our Sunday night live service. That's Sunday nights at 6 o'clock at our Maple campus, and this is just a great time of, of worship, a great time of sharing, and fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a wonderful time. We invite you to come and check that out, too. Lots of stuff going on. Familiarize yourself with the website. Check those things out. Uh, but before we pray, I want to invite one of our elders, Ben Dillon, to come up for a special announcement. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Actually, I am here this morning, church family, to share a, a brief message with you on behalf of the chairman of our elder board and the rest of our elders, um, actually a message written by our chairman. So if you'd allow me to do so, I'm uh, just going to go ahead and read this letter that was written on behalf of the elders. It says, church family, 2020 has proven to be a very challenging year. Not only have we been dealing with a worldwide pandemic that's affected the lives of, of our own and many in our city, our schools, and our other churches. We've also recently experienced forest fires in our backyard. It's been a tough time for us, and it's also been a very challenging time for our pastors. But with all that we have been through, our pastors have never stopped working, stopped serving, or stopped praying for us. They've met the challenge head on as one team working together with a common goal, to spread the good news to you and I to spread the good news not only to us, but through us. Whether through text messages, emails, Zoom meetings, the pulpit, or good old-fashioned phone calls, our pastors have never abandoned their mission to preach and teach the gospel of Christ, to lead and to guide the flock in a way pleasing to the Lord. I share this with you because October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And on behalf of the elders, we would encourage you to reach out to your pastors, reach out with a word of encouragement, uh, a card, a text, an actual letter, you know, one with like stamps and then you put in the mail. Reach out with, with a plate of cookies or, or drop off a cup of coffee, whatever it is. Whatever you choose to do, we ask that you, you join us in doing so because in a year like this, when the flaming arrows of the enemy are headed directly at them, we invite you to let our pastors know just how much we love and we appreciate them. I'll close by sharing a scripture from Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Would you pray with me right now for our pastors during this month? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you not only that you've blessed us with a plurality of pastors, Father, here in our, in our local body. Father, we thank you for a, a, a shared teaching team, Father, for, for the ministry through, through worship and, and other aspects of service, Father, that our pastors lead us in. Lord, we asked 
Father, not only for this month, but, but throughout, Lord, um, just throughout the years, God, that you would strengthen and protect our pastors, Lord. We know that as they do your work, that is not something that, that Satan wants to see happen. So we pray that you would guard and protect them, protect their families, Lord. Father, we also ask that you would continue to encourage them. They are men, Father, just like the rest of us. They, they struggle, and, and it can be hard, and it can be discouraging at times, Lord. But I thank you for their commitment, Father, their strength that they draw from you, their commitment to teach and preach your word, their commitment, Lord, to love us as your people, even when we're unlovable. I thank you, Father, for the blessing that you've given us in the pastors that you have drawn here to Campus Bible Church. So we lift them up to you, Father. We thank you for them. We pray that you would encourage them and just bless them in a special way, each and every one of them, Lord, during this, this month of October um, or Pastor Appreciation Month. And Lord, that you would just continue to minister through them and do amazing things here, Father, in our local church and as we reach beyond our walls to our city, to our country, and throughout this globe. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. This song is called The Gospel. Heartwarming to remember, think when our kids choir sang this years, a couple years ago, not only our glow outreach, but for our church family, reminding us that the good news is our hope and our anchor. We can rally around that. This generation turning over every stone, hoping to find salvation in the world that's left us cold. So, can we get back to the altar? Get back to the altar of our first love. There's only one way to the Father, and He's calling out to us. To the captive, it looks like freedom. To the orphan, it feels like home. To the skeptic, it might sound crazy to believe in a God who loves. In a world where our hearts are breaking and are lost in the mess we made. Like a blinded light in the dead of night, it's a gospel.
Amen. I love it. Thank you, worship team. I absolutely love that song. And the gospel made a way for me personally uh, 27 years ago when a friend of mine invited me to church. His name was Marco. And at the time, I was 22 years old. And I was sailing around the world on a great adventure, traveling, exploring, partying, drifting from place to place, and really searching for meaning and purpose in my life. Well, I thought I could find that in drugs, relationships with women, and some kind of spiritual, mystical quest for enlightenment. But then I met Marco, just a simple Christian who witnessed to me and invited me to church. He befriended me. He spent time with me. He taught me how to pray and read the Bible. And on February 13, 1993, God opened my heart to the gospel that we just sang about. A few months later, I moved to Santa Cruz and I met a man by the name of Don Adams. Don was a a great friend of mine, a rugged mountain man from Alaska. He loved the Lord and he loved the lost. He introduced me to door-to-door evangelism. He taught me how to share my faith. And he helped me develop a passion for outreach. In the year 2000, I loaded pretty much everything I owned into my truck. I drove to Dallas, Texas to go to seminary. And there I met a professor by the name of Jeff Bingham who became my academic advisor. Dr. Bingham's lectures in historical theology absolutely rocked my world, and he helped me rethink and refine my theology. He exposed me to the greatest theologians in church history, and he deepened my love for doctrine. Then in 2008, God called me to Fresno. I came on staff here at Campus Bible Church and began serving under the leadership of Pastor Jim Cece. For the past 12 years, Jim has been a friend, a mentor, and a spiritual father. He's helped me become a better pastor, and he's modeled what it looks like to have the heart of a true shepherd. As I look back on my life, there are a lot of people who have made an impact on me. My parents, my wife, my daughter. But right at the top of the list are those spiritually mature men who took an interest in me, believed in me, and invested in me. The kind of Christian that I am today is due in part to their influence, their prayers, their friendship, and their support. So today I want to talk about the importance of mentoring and discipling others in the Christian faith. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the epistle of 2 Timothy. Last week, Pastor Will talked about guarding the true treasure in our lives. The treasure of the Gospel that's been entrusted to us, and the treasure of our relationships. At the end of chapter 1, he mentioned three individuals, Onesiphorus, Phygelus, and Hermogenes. Onesiphorus was a faithful servant of Christ who ministered to Paul when he was in jail. He wasn't ashamed of Paul's chains, and he wasn't afraid to be identified as a Christian, but Phygelus and Hermogenes, they abandoned Paul in his time of need. They ran away like cowards. Now, in chapter 2, Paul encourages Timothy to be like Onesiphorus. He urges him to be brave, keep going, and not turn away from his calling like Phygelus and Hermogenes did. Let's pick up our study in chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2.1 reads, You therefore, my son, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice this isn't an appeal for Timothy to summon his own inner strength, boost his self-confidence, or conjure up his own self-esteem. No, he tells Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
Because that's where the power is located. In the free, omnipotent, inexhaustible grace of God, not within ourselves. And by the way, that was the secret of Paul's strength as an apostle. He told the Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So if you feel weak and inadequate and uncertain how God could possibly use you to impact other people's lives, all I have to say is welcome to the club. You're in good company. Timothy was timid. And Paul was plagued by a thorn in the flesh. But they both discovered that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. And His grace is sufficient for any task that He may call us to, no matter how frightening it may be. Look now at verse 2. Because next Paul lays out an extraordinary task for Timothy that easily could have overwhelmed him except for the grace of God. He writes, "...the things which you have heard from Me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also." In this short verse, Paul lays out what I believe is the Holy Spirit's formula for church growth. It's a divine blueprint for discipleship that contains God's method of fulfilling the Great Commission. And it starts with the content of the Gospel. Again, what we just sang about. Paul writes, "...the things which you have heard from Me in the presence of many witnesses." Now remember that Paul and Timothy spent about 21 years traveling together and ministering together in cities like Ephesus, Corinth, and Thessalonica. And in all those places, his message, Paul's message was the same. Back in chapter 1, Paul told Timothy, guard the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Well, what was the treasure? It was the standard of sound words that Timothy received from Paul. The doctrinal truths that Paul had received by direct revelation from Christ. It was the glorious message of the Gospel. And notice how Paul emphasizes it was heard in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, it never changed. It was always consistent. Always reliable. And it was corroborated by the other apostles and thousands of eyewitnesses heard it. It makes me think of the writings of the church fathers in the 2nd and 3rd century. It's absolutely mind-blowing and amazing to realize that virtually the entire New Testament can be reconstructed from the Scripture quotations included in just their writings. They wrote down Scripture exactly as it was handed down to them because they recognized it was the inspired, authoritative Word of God. It's so amazing. Today, we have almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, and 9,000 manuscripts in other ancient languages. Just this overwhelming evidence of the importance of Scripture. They, people felt compelled to write it down. In this verse, Paul uses the verb entrust, which can be translated to deposit. You see, God has deposited the truth of His Word with us. And He has preserved it for generations. And it's our responsibility as the church to guard the treasure of the Word of God and pass it on to others, not keep it to ourselves. That's what Paul tells Timothy next. He says, "...the things which you have heard from Me in the presence of many witnesses..." The very words of God that I declared to you, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I want you to notice that there are four generations mentioned in verse 2. The things which you, that's Timothy, have heard from me, that's Paul, 
in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So the four generations are from Christ to Paul, from Paul to Timothy, from Timothy to faithful men, and from faithful men to others. And all of those believers are linked in succession by a common denominator. They all passed on the Gospel that was entrusted to them. Folks, this has been called the ministry of multiplication. And it's God's master plan for spreading the Gospel to the ends of the earth. Shortly before World War II, a Bible distributor by the name of Michael Billister visited a small hamlet in Poland. And he gave a Bible to a villager who was converted by reading it. The new believer then passed on the book to others. The cycle of conversions and sharing continued until 200 people had become believers through that one single Bible. When Billister returned in 1940, This group of Christians, they came together and they met for a worship service. And Billister kind of randomly asked them uh, if anyone could recite any verses of Scripture. One man stood up and said, "Uh, Sir, perhaps we've misunderstood. Did you mean verses or chapters? These villagers had not memorized a few select verses of the Bible, but whole chapters and books. Thirteen people knew Matthew, Luke, and half of Genesis. And another person had committed to memory the entire book of Psalms. That one single copy of the Bible had done its work. Why? Because the believers were committed to sharing God's Word with others, not keeping it to themselves. Let me illustrate this truth in another way using math. I'm not a math guy, but check this out. Suppose there are two boys with a very rich father, and he makes them an offer. They could either choose to receive $100,000 per day for 31 days, it's a lot of money, or they could receive one penny and double it each day for 31 days. Now, if you had the option, which one would you choose? If you chose to take $100,000 per day, at the end of 31 days, you'd have $3,100,000. But if you chose the penny that doubled each day, in the end, you would come out with $2,147,483,648. I mean, that, that number was so big, I could barely read it. It's incredible, right? It shows the power of multiplication versus addition. That's the principle behind this verse. It's exponential growth. Speaking of 2 Timothy 2.2, Billy Graham said this, quote, this is like a mathematical formula for spreading the Gospel and enlarging the church. If every believer followed this pattern, the church could reach the entire world in one generation. Mass crusades in which I believe and to which I have committed my life will never finish the Great Commission, but a one-to-one ministry will. Now at this point, I can hear some people saying, hey, uh, wait a minute, isn't this verse just for leaders? I mean, Paul was an apostle. Timothy was a pastor. He was a church planner. I mean, I'm not an evangelist. You, You can't expect me to do this, but listen. There are no spectators in the Great Commission. Take a look at Matthew 28, 18-20. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that is the final message Jesus gave His followers before returning to heaven. It's literally the final verses in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the climax, the finale of the whole book 
And it's given to all of us who claim to be followers of Christ. If you look closely at the sentence structure of that verse in Greek, you'd notice that there's one main verb and then there's three subordinate participles. Okay, This isn't a grammar lesson, but guess what the main verb is in that sentence? It's make disciples. In other words, the primary mission Jesus gave to the church is to make disciples. And the way we do that is by going into all the world, teaching people to obey all that Jesus commanded, and baptizing them into a new saving relationship with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. David Platt writes, from the start, God's design has been for every single disciple of Jesus to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples until the Gospel spreads to all peoples. Yet we have subtly and tragically taken this costly command of Christ to go, baptize, and teach all nations and mutated it into a comfortable call for Christians to come, be baptized, and listen in one location. Wow. Personally, I think this is why so many churches are shriveling up and dying right now in our country. New churches, anytime you start a new church, it typically starts off with a bang. There's an explosion of energy, and then it fades over time. The first generation is passionate. Believers are full of zeal and love for the lost. They share their faith. They lead people to Christ. And they experience a season of growth. But the second generation is polite. They settle down. The church becomes inwardly focused. People grow complacent. They spend most of their time and their money and their energy. Instead of looking outwards, they look inwards. They spend all of their resources on themselves. They take their eyes off the primary mission. They stop reproducing. When that happens, the third generation is perverted. They depart from the truth of the Gospel. There's no life left. Some may be Christians in name only, but many of the younger people reject the Christian faith altogether. Now we look around and we see that everywhere. We see this trend happen over and over again in churches in our country, around the world. But why does it happen? Why does it keep happening? In my opinion, the underlying cause is a lack of discipleship. It's a failure to implement this principle right here of 2 Timothy 2.2. It all boils down to a defective understanding of what it means to be a disciple. So let's turn our attention to the process of discipleship. I want to ask that very important question. What is a disciple of Christ? The word disciple literally means a learner. In a broader sense, a follower. Someone who follows the teachings of another person. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus gave three conditions or requirements for being His disciple. Look at Him with me. In verse 26, He said, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, cannot be My disciple. The very next verse, 27, He says this, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after Me cannot be My disciple. Just five verses later, six verses in verse 33, He says this, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be My disciple. Now there's a lot in there, but essentially it means Jesus has to have first place in your life. He has to become more important to you than your family. We know He's not literally saying hate your family. The second greatest commandment in all the Scripture is love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying, I have to become more important to you than your own family, than your possessions, than your reputation, than your comfort, than your own life. Are you willing to die for me? Are you willing to lay down your life for me? Because I lay down my life for you. Let me point out one more verse. In Luke 6.40, 
Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So let's think about this. Jesus said a disciple will be like his teacher. And he said that being his disciple required renouncing everything in order to follow in his footsteps and obey his uh, commands. We talked about the Great Commission, how Jesus commanded his disciples to go into the world and make more disciples. So my question is this, how can someone be a disciple who doesn't make disciples? That's like saying you can be a follower who doesn't follow. Or a learner who doesn't learn. How does that make any sense? So any credible definition of discipleship has to contain within it this concept of reproduction, of multiplication. What is a disciple? One answer has to be a disciple is a disciple maker. Folks, it's not enough for you just to see yourself as a disciple. You have to see yourself as a disciple maker. You must see that your sacred mission in life is making disciples who in turn make disciples. The job of a baker is to make bread. The job of an artist is to make paintings. And the job of a disciple is to make disciples. So if we claim to be disciples, but we don't make disciples, we're fooling ourselves. And something is wrong with our theology. Do you see yourself as a servant of Christ whose primary mission and very purpose in life is to multiply and fulfill the Great Commission? If not, I'm praying this morning that this message would completely mess up your life. I'm praying that it will reorder your values, and your priorities. And I say this kindly. You need to repent. You need to get right with God because you're calling yourself a Christian, but you're living in disobedience to the Great Commission, the very mission and purpose that Christ put you on this planet. You're missing it. Now, what does it look like to make disciples? Does that mean we have to all go to seminary and get a degree? Do we all have to become Bible teachers or stand up here on the platform and preach? Do we have to all go out onto the streets and and become preachers on, on the street corners? No, of course not. God made us all different. He gave us all different spiritual gifts. So God wants you to be yourself. He wants to use your unique gifts and talents and abilities and personalities to make disciples. I hope that frees you up a little bit. But listen, we can't use that as an excuse to not share the gospel. We can't say, well, I'm not a preacher, so I, you know, it's, I, it's not my job to make disciples. No, all of us need to share our faith and invest in the lives of others. As I was preparing this message, I, I thought of Leisha Clark, for example. She uses music as a bridge to build relationships with people and share Christ with them. That's why she started this nonprofit ministry, Inspire One. But listen, I could never do that. I could never do what Leisha does. I'm not musically gifted in the slightest. So, no matter what unique approach we take, there are some common denominators here. I think effective discipleship has three crucial common denominators. Let's take a look at them. Number one, effective discipleship is doctrinal. It involves intentionally sharing the Gospel to lead people to Christ and then instructing them in the Word of God. It's got to be rooted and grounded in the Bible. The goal of this whole thing is to help people learn and understand Scripture so they can develop a Christian worldview and begin to think and live biblically. Again, this doesn't mean you have to be a Bible scholar. It just means you have to share what you know. If you are a brand new Christian right now, you have come to understand the Gospel, you have so much to offer. You have so much to share with other people who don't know Christ. One day, a college student went to talk to his professor about some difficulties he was having learning. He said, well, professor, I'm studying hard. I'm doing my best. 
but I just I can't retain what I'm reading, what I'm, what I'm trying to memorize. Do you think it would help if I hired a tutor? Clearly understanding the young man's problem, the instructor replied, no, I wouldn't recommend that at all. You don't need a, tu- a teacher, you need a pupil. The professor understood that we learn about 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 70% of what we say or write, and 90% of what we teach. The reason some of us Christians aren't growing is because we're stuffing our heads full of information and we're not sharing it with anyone. If that's the case, we don't need to learn more. We need to obey more and share more. We need to start giving our treasure away. So listen, don't underestimate what you have to offer. Every Christian has something to share. And you have a lifetime of opportunity to share it. Number two, effective discipleship is relational. A recent Barna study called Faith for Exiles investigated this phenomenon of why so many young people are leaving the Christian faith when they reach adulthood. And what they found, I think, was so fascinating. It basically came down to the quality of their relationships. They found that only one in ten young people who left the church had ever been mentored. On the other hand, among those who continued in their faith, 40% had been mentored. 77% had meaningful relationships with adults in the church. And 72% admired the faith of their parents. Folks, God is a relational being. He's designed us as relational beings. And the Christian faith is meant to be lived and enjoyed in the context of rich, rewarding, vibrant relationships. That's why we don't just need teachers. We need spiritual fathers and mothers, role models, mentors, coaches, and guides. We need friends who are willing to live the Christian life right alongside of us. By the way, I just need to pause right here, say law for a moment, and say this. I believe one of the greatest opportunities we have to make disciples is in our own families. We're commanded to go into all the world, but there's a world of opportunity in our own home. And I think that's where discipleship should begin because if we can't disciple our own children and we can't get our own families in order, how can we possibly expect to help others? That leads to the last point, number three. Effective discipleship is practical. Don't miss this, okay? Your life is the ultimate curriculum that God uses to help mature you as a disciple. All of our learning should take place in the context of real life. Uh, What you study, what you learn, uh, what you read in the Bible, it should impact your life. It should change your life. Christianity is not theoretical. It's practical. We don't learn for the sake of learning. We learn for the sake of being godly. Of becoming more like Christ. So right now, I'm preaching to you the Word of God, but but listen, if you don't process this message, if you don't discuss it with someone or share it with someone, if you don't apply it directly to your own circumstances, it's going to have virtually no impact on your life. You're going to walk away. You're going to forget about almost everything I said. And you're not going to be any different. So remember, knowledge is not discipleship. Listening to sermons is not discipleship. True discipleship occurs only when you learn the doctrines of the Christian faith, live them out with integrity, and transfer those principles to someone else. Learn it. Live it. Transfer it. That's biblical discipleship. I'd like to close with the story of Edward Kimball. A man who's virtually unrecognized in the annals of history. He was a simple, dry goods salesman who lived in Detroit, and he taught a children's Sunday school class. 
One day in the year 1854, he felt led to share the gospel with a 17-year-old boy who was working in a shoe store. That boy received Christ and went on to become one of the greatest evangelists in American history. His name was D.L. Moody. But the story doesn't end there. Through his ministry, Moody was responsible for a London pastor named F.B. Meyer coming to faith. Meyer, in turn, was responsible for J. Wilbur Chapman coming to faith. From there, Chapman mentored a man by the name of Billy Sunday, who discipled a man by the name of Mordecai Ham, who led a young man by the name of Billy Graham to Christ, who over the course of his lifetime preached the gospel to 2.2 billion people. Imagine what would have happened if that simple salesman, that, that Sunday school class teacher, chickened out and said, I'm not going to go into that store and share the gospel with that boy, that young 17-year-old boy, D.L. Moody. To me, this is such a wonderful illustration of God's plan for discipleship. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Are you part of that plan? Are you fulfilling the Great Commission? The great purpose for your life? The reason why God left you on this planet instead of taking you straight to heaven? Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So look around you. Pray for the people that God has put in your life. They're all around you. Your family. Your friends. Your co-workers. The neighbors who live right next door to you. Folks, I want to ask you this question. Who is God calling you to disciple? If you're a believer, you're born again, you know Jesus Christ, that's your mission in life. Who is God calling? putting on your heart right now? Who is He calling you to disciple? Will you pray about that this week? Will you ask God, what do you want me to do in response to this message? I don't just want to be someone who learns and fills my head with knowledge. I want to put my faith into action. God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to talk to? Call them up. Talk to them. Offer to spend time with them. Invite somebody to study the Bible with you and keep Building those relationships. Will you pray with me? Father, I want to thank You as always for Your precious Word, Your your promises, the power of Your Word. Father, today this message was just two verses and I I found myself completely overwhelmed at the enormity and the the vastness and the scope of, of this mission. And Lord, I have a sense that as much as we're a teaching church, And as much as I know there are godly families that that are walking with you and living with you, and and I think many of us, we care about our kids and we're trying to disciple our kids and raise them in the Lord. And yet, Lord, I still have this sense and this conviction that a lot of what we do in our Sunday school classes or or our growth groups when we get together, uh, a lot of even people who mean well and, and they turn on the TV to watch a sermon, I just think a lot of that ends uh, like the Dead Sea. It never goes anywhere because we don't have the mindset of being a disciple maker. We just look at ourselves as disciples. It's all about me being fed and me being and growing and being blessed and being encouraged. It's not about how can I take this information and transfer it, impart it to somebody. How can I give this treasure away? How can I grab a hold of that promise from Your Word, God, and begin to speak it over the lives of other people? How can I be a blessing to others? How can I witness to others? How can I share with others? Oh, God. God, this morning... We had men in our church stand up here and and pray for humility and repentance and faith. God, may we take that prayer today and take it to heart when we think about this great commission. May You give us humility to really honestly look at ourselves and say, am I taking this mission seriously? Is it... Is it the top priority of my life? 
Jesus said, you need to love me even more than your own family. Is it the top priority of our life? Is it the great commission or is it just a mission? Is it 42 points down on the list? Is it, is it less important than our jobs? Less important than our houses? Less important than our comfort? God, help us to truly repent. And help us to have faith to believe that you can use us. You can use me. God, sometimes I just don't think you can use me. I, I marvel. I wonder. God, how could you use me? But all the power is yours. All the glory is yours. The saving power is yours. The resurrecting power is yours. The convicting power is yours. The ability to change a heart, to change a mind, to change a life. It's all yours. To you belong the glory. You just simply invite us to be your hands and feet, to be your mouth, to be part of this process. So God, may we take 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to heart today as well. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Help us to obey you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother, so much. Let's sing the words of a precious poem written out of the Great Awakening. One man wakes, awakens another. Second wakes his next door brother. If we are eight, can rise a town and turn the whole place upside down. Move, we pray, God. One man wakes, awakens another, second one wakes, the next door brother. Free awake and rise in town and turn the whole place upside down. Many awake will cause such a fuss, finally awakes the rest of us. One man wakes with down in his eyes, surely then it multiplies, surely then it multiplies. saints get up and put your hands together let's see what the spirit of god can do to work through our lives come on say one man wakes awakens at night the second one wakes the next door burn three awake and rise in town turn the whole place upside down oh many awake will cause it to fuss finally awakes the rest of us one man wakes with down his eyes surely they need multiplies surely Surely then it multiplies. Yeah, whoa, 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 Can rise in town and turn the whole place upside down. Many awake will cause such a fuss. And finally awakes the rest of us. One man awakes with down in his eyes. Surely then it multiplies. Surely then it multiplies. And as we were singing that song, I had the image of a Christmas morning when the first child wakes up excited about the day. And they're not gonna share that excitement alone. They're gonna wake up every other child and their parents. There's something about awakenings that bring enthusiasm and excitement. And we are praying 
for a great awakening here in our midst, in our community, and around the world. But not just an awakening of people who come to a saving knowledge of Christ, who are disciples, but an awakening of those that even know Christ and become disciple-making disciples. Oh, how we want that. And we're here to help you with that. It is not only our prayer and our passion, it is also our responsibility to equip you to do what we have been called to do, to make disciples around this globe. We allow us to do that, to pray for you. If you need help, we're here for you anytime. We love you. We thank you for being with us this morning, and we ask you to join us in prayer. Father, in the spirit of that great awakening song, we ask for an awakening of our own hearts. The complacency, yes, so we have moved from being pilgrims to perhaps tourists. And Father, we don't want to just be partakers of the things. We want to be participants in the gospel. And so, Father, thank you for these reminders today, for this time of worship, this time of celebration. And yes, we pray this time of awakening in the strong and the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One time we say, one man wakes, awakens another. The second one wakes, the next so proud. The three awake and rise and down, and they turn the whole place upside down. No man you awake will cause a fuss. Finally awakes the rest of us. One man wakes with down his eyes. Surely they need multiply. Surely they need multiply. Such a fuss, finally awakes the rest of us. One man awakes with dawn inside. Surely they need multiply. Surely they need multiply.